Previously, we've covered the history of Ukraine and Crimea throughout the 20th century. Leading up to the Russian attack in February 2022. As part of that, we took an extensive look at the 2014 events, including the Euromaidan protests, the overthrow of Viktor Yanukovych, and the subsequent occupation and annexation of Crimea by the Russian Federation. That's the portion of the 2014 events that remains largely in the public consciousness today, at least outside of Ukraine. But something else we covered in the Ukraine-Russia documentary, which may have gotten buried amongst the Euromaidan and Crimea stories, and which has also been forgotten or overlooked by the public at large, may actually be the most important part of the 2014 events to examine when analyzing the current war. It was the first instance of large-scale tank maneuvers and encirclement battles on the Ukrainian steppe since the Second World War, 70 years earlier. Briefly, the world's attention would be forced to turn to the conflict though only in the wake of immense tragedy, before fading into obscurity again. It's the Donbass War of 2014-15. to We pick up with our coverage of the 2014 events starting in April, just after the annexation of Crimea had been completed, as the world's attention had begun to drift away from Ukraine. In early April, GRU and FSB-affiliated operatives worked with local pro-Russian protesters to seize government buildings in Donetsk. After the seizures on April 6th, Ukraine sent in special internal police, which recaptured the buildings for Ukraine the next day. The buildings were retaken on April 12th by by FSB and GRU affiliated forces, who the same day also seized Ukrainian government buildings in Slovyansk. The fighters had already declared the formation of the Donetsk People's Republic. Reportedly, these events were being directed by forces adjacent to the Kremlin. The next day, April 13th, Ukrainian forces counterattacked in Slovyansk. This effectively marked the start of true military conflict, with Crimea having been annexed without any real battles. The Donbass would be different and would result in war between Russia and Ukraine. For now, though, it was just between Ukraine and the Russian-backed separatists, again led by former Russian GRU, who had declared their intent, under self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic President Denis Pushilin, to hold their own Crimea-style referendum regarding accession to the Russian Federation. Although this would eventually be postponed, it displays the thinking and the intent of the separatist entities. However, the war continued to expand. By the end of May, the Russian-backed Donetsk forces had seized Mariupol and were attempting to connect it to the rest of their territory. Meanwhile, in the north, a new group of Russian-backed separatists had captured Luhansk and had proclaimed the Luhansk People's Republic. Russia also sent operatives to conduct similar operations in other cities. These included Kharkov, where the declaration of a Kharkov People's Republic saw short-lived success. However, the Ukrainian forces soon pushed the Russian operatives and their local supporters out of the town. An attempt was also made in Odessa, where major clashes left 46 would-be insurgents dead. As fighting raged throughout the summer, the civilian population would suffer immensely. The Russian-backed troops were known to fire missiles from civilian neighborhoods, then move their equipment out of harm's way before the counter-barrage began, leaving civilians to take the brunt of the attacks as human shields. As the leadership of the so-called republics remained contested, various warlords took regional control over their territories, simply paying lip service to the authorities in Donetsk and Lukansk. These warlords were known for extortion, random acts of violence, and even enslavement of civilians civilians who were put to work in the by now shut down coal mines and industrial plants of Donbass. In fact, throughout the summer, violence between warlords and between different separatist factions continued to occur. 
they began to run out of steam. By the 16th of June, Ukraine had recaptured Mariupol. Meanwhile, large-scale fighting was ongoing for control of the Donetsk airport, that despite a first ceasefire attempt by Europe. Ukraine held the airport for now, although much larger scale fighting was to come at the same location. Also at this time, Russia sent their first regular forces into the fight, as after several days of speculation and denials by the Russian government, Pushilin confirmed the presence of Russian tanks in Donetsk. Like in Crimea, the Russians wore no insignia on their uniforms, while their tanks had all insignias painted over. However, this limited Russian help was not enough to stop the Ukrainian momentum, and the Russian-backed forces continued to lose ground. The two people's republics, for their part, had announced a merge into the Novorossiya Confederation, which was to take place after negotiations between the two entities. Presumably, this new confederation would then request its annexation into Russia as a whole. However, the old Russian governorate of Novorossiya included more than just the Donbass. It included the entire southern and eastern portions of Ukraine, from Donetsk in the east all the way to Odessa in the west. Whether this was indeed the final intent of these moves is not known, nor would the confederation come to pass, even between Donetsk and Luhansk, due to the Russian proxy's biggest mistake yet. On July 17th, elements of the Donetsk People's Republic, operating a Russian-provided Buck missile system, announced via social media that they had shot down a Ukrainian cargo plane. However, it would later turn out that this was a civilian airliner, Malaysia Airlines Flight 17. All 293 people on board were killed. As international outrage poured down on the two separatist entities, preventing their confederation and encouraging Ukrainian resolve to take back the territory, Russia began to take advantage of the plausible deniability that they had created from the beginning. Thus, no confederation and annexation to Russia was on the table, as Russia was forced at least publicly to deny all connection with the two entities and could not annex them without essentially taking responsibility for the plane tragedy. Now at the same time, Russia's propaganda outlets did come up with an alternative theory for the shootdown and spread that disinformation, but the situation was so tense that Russia understood in the eyes of the world it would be taking responsibility for the plane shootdown if it was to acknowledge any affiliation with the Donbass republics. What did concern Russia was their loss of territory and disorganized nature. Thus, while fully denying any affiliation with the republics or with their military operations, Russia sent a huge force of thousands of little green men and little green tanks into the area. These were Russian regular forces, and they pushed across to Donetsk, forming a pincer with the rebel forces in Donetsk, and thus putting a large Ukrainian force at Ilovaisk into the cauldron of an encirclement. Over a thousand Ukrainian troops now found themselves entrapped and encircled by Russian tanks. Ukraine launched a breakout attempt the next day. However, the relief force was destroyed by a Russian paratrooper attack. Despite completely denying any Russian involvement in these battles, Vladimir Putin still got publicly involved on August 29th when he announced the creation of a humanitarian corridor for the Ukrainian soldiers if they would surrender. The same day, new Donetsk People's Republic leader Alexander Zakharchenko, a local from Donbass, announced that the said ceasefire had gone into effect and that Ukraine had agreed to fly the white flag and retreat out of two pre-designated quote-unquote humanitarian corridors on their hour-long drive back to Ukrainian lines. However, this would not be honored and both long Ukrainian columns of 60 vehicles plus were ambushed by Russian forces. For the Ukrainian army, overall the Battle of Ilovaisk would result in 700 to 1,000 casualties, including hundreds killed. And that's without even mentioning the civilian humanitarian impact of such large-scale fighting on residential areas. Over the next weeks, another massive battle began to rage, the second battle of the Donetsk airport. With Russian regulars now involved, intense shelling and tank warfare would take place around the airport and its associated facilities. The battle turned into a stalemate, especially after a ceasefire was declared in September, and thus with both sides in the airport area constantly shelling each other, the infrastructure that both sides were attempting to capture was essentially useless, with the airport totally destroyed. However, the strategic military importance of such a facility is significant even if the facility is destroyed, and thus the battle continued to rage for several more months. 
Despite the ceasefire attempt, fighting continued throughout the fall, though few advances were made during this time due to the biannual Rasputitsa, the heavy spring and fall rains that turn the countryside to mud and which mostly limit large-scale military operations in Eastern Europe to summer and winter offensives when the ground is either baked out or frozen. Russia was attempting to eliminate the Ukrainian presence across various salients in the Donbass. By January 15th, the fighting at the airport was over. The Russian-backed Donetsk forces had pushed the Ukrainians completely completely out of the now-destroyed airport. Donetsk leader Alexander Zakharchenko declared victory. Following the renewed fighting at the airport, a new ceasefire attempt was brokered by the European powers. It, like the first ceasefire, did not stop the fighting, at least immediately. The Russians were attempting to eliminate the last salient of Ukrainian control, which presented the threat of splitting the Donbass in two. The key component of this Ukrainian position was the city of Debeltsovo. At the time of the ceasefire, the Russians had surrounded and were besieging the city. The humanitarian situation inside the Debeltsovo cauldron was dire. The Russian-backed forces announced that anyone attempting to flee this kettle would end up in the crosshairs of Russian artillery. Meanwhile, heavy shelling had reduced the formerly vibrant city to ruins. This time, up to 6,000 Ukrainian troops were trapped inside, along with the civilians. Like at Ilovaisk, poor logistics and communication on the part of the Ukrainian army led to the trapped forces remaining encircled for over two weeks. The Russian forces finally entered the city itself on February 17th, and the next day Ukrainian forces began attempting to retreat and break out towards their lines to the north and west. However, this was largely a disaster, with Ukraine suffering another 900-plus casualties, including 267 killed. With Russian-backed forces now in control of a defensible territorial unit, Moscow would order the separatists to honor the ceasefire once the Battle of Debeltsovo had been won. Thus, the Minsk II Accords became the basis for all future peace talks. However, even as the conflict became a frozen conflict, somewhat akin to Abkhazia, South Ossetia, or Transnistria, this frozen conflict over the next eight years was more like the Azeri-Armenian conflict over Nagorno-Karabakh, in which even the frozen conflict stage continued the shelling, sniping, and civilian and military casualties along the front lines. Although Russia had done much to shore up the internal security of the breakaway republics, which effectively were transformed from ragtag entities to Russian puppet states, it appears that some internal power struggles may have continued. In 2018, while eating at a cafe in Donetsk, Donbass local and Donetsk People's Republic leader Alexander Zakharchenko was assassinated via a bomb that was planted in the restaurant. It remains unclear, even to this day, who was behind this assassination. In any case, Pushilin, closer to the Kremlin than Zakharchenko anyway, returned to replace him. In 2018, Russia secured its connection to Crimea. The peninsula's only natural land link is with the now cut off Ukraine, which also supplied much of Crimea's fresh water. Russia got around this by constructing a bridge over the Kerch Strait. Previously during the Second World War, the Germans and Soviets had each attempted construction of a bridge over the strait, but both had been short-lived. This new connection not only secured Russia's political connection to Crimea, but also shored up the peninsula's economic interests and tied them directly to Russia. With road and rail links now available to the peninsula, commercial and tourist activity from Russia has increased, although the water supply issue has not yet been solved, and in fact continued to get worse each year, with Ukraine continuing to cut off the canal in the northern Perikop Isthmus and forcing Russia to come up with alternative water supply plans over the Kerch Peninsula. As time passed since the Malaysian Airlines shootdown, Russia began to make incremental moves towards Towards a new campaign. There were several instances of major saber-rattling on Ukraine's borders between 2019 and 2021, only for Russia to conduct military drills with Belarus and then withdraw. Initially, that appeared to be the case in 2022. However, Western sources kept insisting that they had specific intelligence this was a real Russian invasion force, and negotiations began early in 2022 with Putin. Many assumed that this was just another instance of saber-rattling, or at the most, the Kremlin was going to bite off another chunk of Ukraine and continue to dismember the country bit by bit. 
This appeared initially to be the case on February 21st, when reports began to emerge that Vladimir Putin intended to diplomatically recognize the Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk People's Republic. Importantly, both entities claim the entirety of the Donetsk and Luhansk provinces of Ukraine, despite only controlling a portion of each. Thus, the mutual defense pact that Russia signed with the now-recognized republics essentially authorized the Russian military to assist Donetsk and Luhansk in conquering the remainder of their claimed territory. However, on that day, Vladimir Putin made a major speech in Moscow. From this speech, it was crystal clear that Putin's eyes were fixated on more than just Donetsk and Luhansk, and that Kiev was potentially in the crosshairs. So I hope I was able to shed some light on this overlooked prelude to the current conflict, and I hope that better informs your understanding of the present situation. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe. Please leave a comment to help out the algorithm. Make sure to check out the project that forms the basis for these videos at apoliticalworldmap.org. And if you can, please donate on Patreon. For now, thank you again for watching. I'm Alex. I am out.